Good morning, everyone. Um, still waiting on a few more people to join, and um, and then we'll get started. Welcome. Okay, it's a few minutes after 11. So we are going to go ahead and, and get started on this morning. Um, I am Menominee Boyd and I work for BTA in community outreach. And I'd just like to welcome everyone to our 2023 Transit Service Plan Community Meeting. We do thank you for taking the time out of your schedule on today to join us this morning. Uh, we promise not to keep you too long. Uh, we have us in, in time of one o'clock or 1 p.m. And uh, we know your time is valuable and we want you to be able to enjoy the rest of your day and for the rest of your day to also be productive. Um, today we do have two uh, additional language channels. Uh, we do have one in Spanish and the other is in Vietnamese. Um, we do, we, because we will be having interpretation, um, there may be pauses in the presentation. So um, we want to be able to give the interpreters some time. Uh, also, we do encourage you to call in and speak um, and ask questions and provide your feedback. Uh, but please note that it's easier for our interpreters uh, if you put those questions in the Q&A box. But again, we do encourage you to speak. So if you would like to, uh, that is fine as well. Um, as the community outreach representatives, representative, I'll be your main uh, point of contact for this project. So if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, uh, please feel free to reach out to me um, through the project website um, or the contact information that I'll share with you all um, during the presentation. I'll put that, um, I'll put the website URL and then also my contact information in the chat box for you. Uh, uh, if we do have any elected officials joining us on today, well, we welcome you as well. Uh, if you would like to have, um, if you would like to speak, uh, please raise your hand or let us know in the chat box and we will provide space for you on our agenda um, so that you can have a few words. Uh, I do see a hand raised um, from Trisha Cox. Um, let's see. And then I'll call to. I'm not sure if you would like to have words, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that to allow you to speak. Um, Okay, go ahead and unmute your mic. Good, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Oh, it changed over. I was trying to um, select the language I wanted, which was, which was English. Oh, but okay. It, it wouldn't um, change over, but. Okay. I mean, I, I couldn't, anyway. Um, you're, it's, in, it's in English, uh, maybe it's just on the slide that you'll then transfer over it, it it won't change anything it says original audio interpretation yeah you're off. fine and, okay thank you okay. uh-huh you're welcome 
Okay. All right. A little technical thing there, I guess. Okay. Uh, okay. So on your screen, um, I'm going to be uh, launching a poll. Uh, this is for our demographic um, questions. Uh, again, the, the, this is voluntary. You do not have to answer these questions if you don't want to. Uh, what they do, what these questions allow is for us to know who we, we reached and then they help us to reach out to different communities that may not be represented. Uh, so again, if you would like to fill that out, um, I will leave this up for a few minutes for you. And um, if you wouldn't, if you don't want to, uh, again, you don't, you don't have to. Okay. And then for our agenda um, tonight, um, we will cover the following, okay? And right now we're doing the welcome and introduction. And uh, we'll go over our virtual meeting etiquette and in how to participate in the meeting. Then we will have our staff presentation by Janice Soriano Ramos. Then we'll go through our Q and A session and uh, comments, and we will allow um, all, all of you to chime in. And then we will talk about our closing and our next steps. I would like to uh, just remind you that tonight's, or today's, I'm sorry, today's meeting is being recorded uh, and then we'll post it to the website and then we'll provide you all with a copy of the slides on the website as well. Okay, and as far as our meeting etiquette, I'll just go through and I will read the, um, I'll read what's, what's here and we'll keep it succinct and we will, and we hope that we don't have any issues. So we would like for you to treat all participants with kindness, respect, and consideration. Uh, type your questions and comments in the Q&A. Um, we do ask that you just hold them to the end of the meeting. Uh, you can, again, type them in the Q&A or we'll go over how to um, ask your questions out loud as well. Uh, when you're not speaking, we do ask you to mute your audio, and then we ask for you to raise your hand if you would like to speak, and then lower your hand uh, when not speaking. Uh, the part that I don't like, but I must say, uh, VTA does not tolerate demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech. Um, I don't want to do this. I've never had to do this, but um, we will remove participants who refuse to adhere to this code because we want everyone to be um, comfortable and we want everyone to be heard. And then how to participate. So if, um, if you would like to speak during our Q&A um, to unmute your mic, uh, I will give you permission to do that. Uh, then you can just click unmute myself so that everybody can hear you. Um, and then uh, and then after you speak, you can just mute your mic again. Um, to be called on, we ask that you use the raise your hand feature that's um, located, that's listed here. And I will uh, call on you so that you can make a comment or ask a question. Uh, we do have, again, the Q&A box or a question and answer box. Uh, any Anytime you have a question, anytime during the meeting, you can feel free to put the question in that box. And what we will do is during the Q&A session, uh, I will go through the, the questions and I will read those out loud to everyone. Or if it's just a question that you have that's not about the 2023 plan um, necessarily, you can go ahead and put that question in the box too. And then one of the people from our staff will answer it in the, in the answer in the box. Okay. okay, and then if you are participating via phone, uh, press star nine and that'll raise your hand and I'll be able to see that as well. And then I can call on you and then you'll be able to speak. Okay, okay. and then tonight's presenters or today's presenters, I keep saying tonight because we have night meetings. So if I do that, I apologize. <laughs> uh, but today's presenters are Janice Soriano Ramos 
and she will be providing the um, the meat and potatoes for you. And uh, she is our senior transportation planner, planner, and she is the project manager uh, for the for the transit plan. And again, myself, Menominee, uh, I am the public communication specialist, uh, and I am the facilitator and the outreach lead for the project. Okay. And then we also have several members from the VTA staff that are um, here. Deanna Bolio, who's our community outreach supervisor. Stephen Chi, he's our transit service development specialist. Kermit Cuff, who's our transit service development supervisor. And Joseph Santiago, who's our transportation planner. Um, and then I did get a note that we have an elected official um, who has joined us today. Uh, so I just have, like to say welcome to um, uh, Kitty Moore and thank you for joining us. Okay. Okay. And so there's this feedback that we need from you. So, oh, I think I can hear Vietnamese in our room. Just a second. Okay. So, uh, feedback that we need from you. So comments on service changes, um, as we focus on a full return to um, service, and then there's things that may have changed for you during the pandemic. Um, we would like to know if this transit plan will still serve you well. And we would also like to know how it could be better. And then we would like to know what service changes are most valuable to you as um, transit makes a full recovery. Okay. Okay. And um, VTA staff roles, what we will do is we will explain the proposal to you. We will pass your feedback on to the uh, VTA board, and then we will use that feedback to revise the plan. And now uh, we will get to the reason that you are all here that I've finished with the preliminaries. I would like to welcome Janice, Je Janice Soriano Ramos as she provides the plan to you. And then I will be back uh, when it's time for our Q and A. Welcome Janice. Thank you, Menominee, and thanks everyone again for being available this, this morning to join us uh, to talk about the transit service plan. I did wanna say before I get started, if you notice that my pace is a little more gentle, I do wanna remind everyone that we do have interpreters here with us today. So I thank you for your patience as we go through the information for the plan. So with that said, for those of you who tuned into our transit service in 2020, I'm very glad we're here under better circumstances to talk about transit service. For those of you who are new to our service, I'd like to welcome you and make a quick introduction to transit service plans before we get into what we will get into in 2023. When we talk about transit service plans, we describe exactly what bus and light rail service should look like. Everything from when, uh, where routes travel and stop, how often our buses and trains come, also uh, called frequency, and early and late our service runs. We also call that the service span or the hours of operation. These service plans are created together both by our riders and VTA. So plans to revise this plan, or we, we plan to revise this plan with you all every year. Before the pandemic, we worked with you all through an extensive years long process uh, an engagement period to completely redesign the entire transit network in our 2019 new transit service plan. And from that point forward, we'd like that chance to build off that service plan and make that network better with you each and every year. So 
So that brings us to today and the goals that we'll strive for in the 2023 service plan. As I mentioned, this is a plan that's focused on restoring full service based on our 2019 plan. We've made it past the service cuts that happened in March of 2020, and we've only been recovering our service since then. So this plan will be the one that we diligently ramp up our service as quickly as we can while we hire more operators to carry out the service. And on top of that, we've also made some service changes throughout the pandemic. And we really made those changes to help our riders make the most essential trips. We've added new routes, changed the routing on some of our routes, and have even been able to make some services run more often. These are changes we've heard have been very useful for our riders, and we'd like to adopt them as part of this new network. And what's more, we're also in a fortunate enough place to make additional improvements to our hours of operation and service frequencies on some of our routes so that they meet VTA's transit service guidelines. We couldn't do that entirely in the 2019 plan, and we are really excited to see what you all think about these changes happening in 2023. We really want to hear from you and make sure that however we recover the service, that it's done in the most helpful and equitable way for riders who depend on it the most. So every year when we talk about a service plan, you can expect to look at our process to look like this. But here's how this year's schedule is going to look. We spent a couple of months this spring de developing the draft plan that we're talking about this morning. And from now through the beginning of July, we'll be sharing the draft plan with you and we'll be collecting any feedback you have. We'll be wrapping up comments in July, then have enough time, uh, that'll give us enough time to revise the plan in August based on your input, just in time to have VTA's committees chime in and have the board adopt the plan by October. And then finally, in January, starting in January, we'll be able to gradually roll out the service throughout the year as we hire enough bus operators to carry out full service throughout 2023. So now we can get into the details about the 2023 plan, starting with our first goal to restore full service. As most of you know, today, we do not have enough operators to run full service. So we're running at about 91% of what we used to run on bus for uh, pre-pandemic and 76% of our pre-pandemic light rail service. For our riders, here's what's left to restore. We still need to return to our pre-pandemic real frequencies, meaning every 15 minutes on weekdays, and every 20 minutes on weekends. We also need to restore some early morning and late evening service in some areas of our transit network. And finally, we also still need to restore weekend service back to their pre-pandemic levels. Our second goal for the 2023 service plan is to adopt some service changes that we made during the pandemic as part of our full network next year. And here you will see that all these changes began in 2021, including two new routes and some changes to the path of travel on six of our routes. And I will go over details about these routes in the next few slides.
The first new route we added last summer was the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center shuttle or the SCVMC shuttle. This is a route that we proudly partner with the County of Santa Clara on to fund so that essential workers at the VMC campus at Bascom have a convenient, reliable connection to transit at the Deridon station. Since this is a transit feeder shuttle service, it provides a few morning trips to Valley Medical and a few afternoon trips back to Deridon station. This service is also open to all riders who may be visiting or have appointments in the morning. But of course, this shuttle is really geared to meet VMC employees' work shifts and train schedules, um, as well as train schedules at the Deridon station. The Rapid 568 is the second new route that we added this past fall, connecting South County with downtown San Jose. And this route provides weekday, all day service in both directions throughout the day, every 30 minutes. This is unlike the express route 168 it replaces, which only ran four northbound trips in the morning and four southbound trips in the evening. Starting in 2023, we are proposing to run the service later in the evening running it as late as 7.30 in the evening every weekday. And so now we'll be talking about the six routes whose path of travel we changed during the pandemic, starting with the Rapid 523, which previously ran between Lockheed Martin down through downtown Sunnyvale, and into downtown San Jose before serving the Berryessa BART station. Beginning in February of last year, the route was changed so that it ends in downtown San Jose at 7th and Santa Clara Street. This route will return to running every 15 minutes throughout the week, but starting in 2023, we are proposing to shift the hours of operation to start later in the morning. And to quickly show you where the Rapid 523 stops in downtown San Jose today, here is a map that illustrates this part of the service that serves San Carlos Street, travels up First Street through the Light Rail Transit Mall, and eventually turns around at 7th Street and Santa Clara Street to make its way back towards Lockheed Martin. Route 59, which serves Santa Clara and runs between Valley Fair and Bay Point Station in Santa Clara. And Route 60, which connects the Mopita Spart Station and the San Jose Airport to the Winchester Station in Campbell, also went through some slight changes in the fall. Both routes have been extended to Winchester and Stevens Creek to improve connections to other bus routes on these streets. And as a result, they no longer pull into the Valley Fair Transit Center on Forest Drive. Of course, no changes to their frequencies and hours of operation are proposed. However, both routes will be restored to their pre-pandemic levels in 2023. Route 61, which connects Sierra and Piedmont in San Jose to the Good Sam Hospital in South San Jose, was also changed last October so that its frequent service extends all the way north to Sierra and Piedmont, as you see here on the map to the right. Buses from Bascom and Union to Sierra and Piedmont will now come every 15 minutes on the weekdays and every 20 minutes on the weekends. But the south part, as you see here on the bottom of this map, serving Good Sam will still run local service every 30 minutes on weekdays 
and every 40 minutes on weekends. No changes to its pre-pandemic frequencies are proposed, but in 2023, we are proposing to extend the hours of operation later to midnight on weekdays and Saturdays, and until 11 p.m. on Sundays. And now we're getting into the last set of routes with changes last year. You'll notice that Route 70 and 71, which run parallel to each other and both serve the East Ridge Transit Center, traded endpoint destinations last October. Route 70 extends to Capitol Station instead of East Ridge, and Route 71 no longer serves the Capitol Station and is the one that ends at East Ridge instead. An exciting change we're proposing for Route 71 for next year is its conversion to a frequent route from a local route, meaning that we'd like to have the buses come every 15 minutes on weekdays throughout the entire route instead of every, just every 30 minutes. So to drive that point home, here is a comparison of the old and the new configurations of both routes. Route 70 from, uh, from Milpitas BART to Eastridge was split into a route uh, with two different frequencies before the pandemic, with that part between uh, Berryessa BART and Eastridge having buses come every 15 minutes uh, as a frequent route. And Route 71 from Milpitas to Capitol Station was a local route. And that route had buses come only every 30 minutes. For the 2023 plan, the one that you see on the right, we are suggesting that Route 70 run every 30 minutes from Milpitas BART to Berryessa BART. <clears throat> and every, um, or every, sorry, every 30 minutes from Milpitas BART to Berryessa BART, excuse me, and every 15 minutes on weekdays uh, from Berryessa BART to Capitol Station. And we're also proposing that Route 71 become a brand new 15 minute frequent route from Milpitas Transit Center all the way down to East Ridge. Headed into our third set of changes for the 2023 service plan. These are routes whose hours of operation and service frequencies we are looking forward to improving to meet our service guidelines for next year. The routes you see here will have improved hours of operation starting next year with some gaining later evening service on weekdays and others gaining earlier morning or later evening service on weekends. These routes on this slide starting next year will have improved frequencies to some extent in their schedules. Most notably, as I mentioned, Route 71 will um, will become a frequent route every uh, running every 15 minutes on weekdays and every 20 minutes on Saturdays. And Route 42 that serves Evergreen Valley College and the Santa Teresa Station will run every 45 minutes on weekdays instead of every hour. And this set of routes will have new weekend service that was not ever offered before the pandemic. Route 21, which only ran from the Stanford Shopping Center to Mountain View on Sundays, will extend to Santa Clara on Sundays starting in 2023. Route 31 that connects Evergreen Valley College to East Ridge will have hourly Sunday service next year. 
and Route 53, which connects Sunnyvale Transit Center to Santa Clara Transit Center by way of Homestead Road, will have hourly weekend service next year. Lastly, a fourth point we wanted to hit with the 2023 plan and exactly why we're meeting here this morning is to gather your valuable input on the service and see that we recover it to full service most equitably for our riders who need the service the most. Oftentimes when we revise transit service, we are asked how that will impact VTA's paratransit riders, especially since paratransit service covers a standard priced three quarter mile area from our fixed route transit and a premium priced one mile area from fixed transit. Since the 2023 service plan does not propose routing changes, beyond these service buffers that I just mentioned, it really makes no change to VTA's paratransit service boundaries. In areas where the 2023 service plan improves early morning and late night service, those same areas in the paratransit network also gain those improvements in the times of day that the service operates. Along with these service plans, we also do what we call a Title VI service equity analysis, which reviews how the service changes in the plan affect our historically underserved communities compared to the rest of the population in VTA's service area. In our analysis so far, we found that this early draft plan does not make impacts on communities of color that are larger than the impacts on the rest of the population, nor does it place burdens on low-income communities that are larger than the burdens on the rest of the population. And taking the analysis further, we also wanted to quantify the service improvements or the ridership potential for communities of color and low-income communities. And so far, we're finding that the communities of color and low-income communities will receive the most benefits from the, uh, from the service changes we've proposed for 2023. We are seeing proportionally larger improvements for weekday service for our equity-focused communities. And with all of the Sunday improvements that we've proposed so far, we're even seeing those improvements significantly benefiting our equity-focused communities compared to the general rider population. A final consideration I would like to share is which routes within our network serve the highest proportion of communities of color. Also what we call our Title VI designated routes. We have found that even before the pandemic, these routes have made up around 60% of VTA's system-wide ridership. And that number has slightly risen as we've observed uh, the pandemic ridership as well. All this to say that because these routes carry our, um, the most of our transit dependent riders, we've aimed for this 2023 service plan to make the most positive impact on our routes, serving high proportions of our historically underserved riders. So that's a wrap for the highlights on the 2023 service plan. 
I really hope this was useful to all of you who've called in and maybe answered any lingering questions you had about what's proposed for next year. If not, we will of course be starting our question and answer sessions here shortly. So please stay on if you'd like. We would love to hear from you as we know these proposals won't be perfect for everyone. But if there's a route that you were curious about that didn't get covered today, uh, please visit our website that's listed here. That's vta.org forward slash 2023 service plan. And on that page, you can take a look at the maps and propose service changes by route. Um, there's, there's several tables on, on that page as well for you to look at. And if you'd like to leave us detailed comments, you can still, of course, leave them on our webpage, or you can email them to, or call our customer service team, who will then share your feedback with us. Uh, some, some next steps here to cover before our Q&A session. We will be wrapping up engagement and taking public comments until July 8. And to give us enough time to consider your comments, revise the plan and present to our committees near the end of the summer, October 6 is when the VTA board meets to adopt the final plan. And finally, beginning on January 8 of next year, you'll start to see some of the adopted service take effect gradually. This plan, of course, entirely rests on hiring enough more bus operators to bring us back to full service throughout the year. And of course, there will be multiple opportunities in 2023 to carry out the planned service. All right, and now to kick off our Q&A, there are three things that we are asking for you all to consider as we spend the next hour plus or so discussing the plan. We would very much appreciate specific comments you have on service changes that are focused on a return to full service. Comments on expanding service to new areas or areas that we don't currently serve are of course welcome anytime, but we will need to be, uh, they will be need to be considered for, for later annual service plans since the focus is on full service. Things may of course have changed for you during the pandemic. And we want to know secondly, if this transit plan will still serve you well. And if not, how could we make it better? And third, we want to better understand what you value the most when we recover our transit service. Is it more frequency, earlier service, later service, better weekend service? Those are just some examples that we'd love for you to chime in on. All right, and now I'll, I'll pass the, the mic back over to Menominee who will facilitate our Q&A. Okay, and thank you, Janice, for that. Um, what I'm doing now is um, you will see a poll that it's just gonna be on your screen in, in just a few minutes. And um, we're, we, again, we're asking um, that you, uh, complete the question, answer the question about your, about uh, VTA's services. Again, you don't have to answer it, uh, but you can um, if you would like to. And so what I'll do is I'll just, I'll leave this up for a few minutes to um, give you all time to uh, answer the question. Okay. And again, uh, if you would like to participate in the Q&A, we ask again that um, you unmute and mute your mic 
Um, if you have a question to ask, uh, raise your hand. I will click. I will allow for you to unmute your mic and I will ask you to do so. Um, you will be able to speak. And then once you have completed your question, uh, then we do ask that you go ahead and mute your mic. Uh, we do have a lot of participants um, here on today. So we want to make sure we give everyone time to ask questions or to make a comment. So we do ask that you keep your questions and comments succinct. Um, again, there we have the question and answer box. You do not have to speak if you don't, if you wouldn't, um, if you don't like to, um, you can go ahead and put your question um, in the Q&A box and then we will go ahead and um, read those out loud for our staff to answer. Okay. And I'm just going to go ahead and give um, a, a little bit more time for those who would like to uh, fill out that, um, to answer that question um, in our poll. Okay. Okay, get about 30 seconds for anyone else who would like to answer. Okay. 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 And we had about um, uh, we had about half of people uh, participate in the poll, and I'll go ahead and share those results with you all. Um, so for increased frequency, um, it looks like we had about two two folks who would like to see that longer hours of operation. We had two route changes. We had one and better transfers, less waiting, we had four. So that seems to be um, the winner on um, today that people would like to see um, better transfers and less waiting. So we thank you for um, sharing that information with us. Okay. All right. Okay. And um, now we will start with the Q&A session. I Okay, I do see one hand raised. Okay, uh, several hands raised. So we'll start with our raised hands. And um, I believe it's Trisha. So we'll start with you. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute your mic. Okay. Thank you, um, so, thank you so much. Uh -huh. um, I just had it, I had a quick, uh, question about how what with all the changes, um, how your signage for these for these um, that your signage be um, readable for for people with disabilities and every everybody, but including that. So um, they need to be for sure in braille and um, low, en low enough so that people in people in wheelchairs can um, see either see the signage or or you know by the, by the by braille or or reading it um, for the for you know either either people in people in chairs or uh, visually impaired um and then also also if um someone is also hearing or if um if they need it auditorily um there's a way they can listen to the signage it it talks so those are my com those are my comments um thank you so much 
Thank you, Tristra, for that feedback. I, I do want to chime in and I also want to make sure that um, there, every single one of our bus stop locations has the braille signage uh, at the right height and braille signage in general. I do know that our passenger facilities team has worked you know, hard throughout the past several months to ensure that every single location does have that braille signage uh, right uh, at the correct height on our bus stop poles. So if, if you'd like, or if you've noticed that there is a location that is missing that signage, do feel free to let us know. We, we certainly want to hear that and, and make sure that we, we've got all the coverage there. So I, I really appreciate your feedback. Yeah, no, no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we will go to... Um, a question in our Q&A box. And um, let's see, let's go to, okay. Uh, we have a question from um, uh, Michael Schulman. Um, it is says, is asking for clarification. When you say that title, uh, Title VI ridership has ridden since the pandemic. Does that mean that the total number of riders from communities of color have increased on these routes as opposed to 2019, or that the number of riders from communities of color has risen as a percentage of total ridership? I can certainly clarify that, Michael. So thanks for your question. Uh, what I mean is, uh, actually you asked it correctly in, in the second part of your question, and the uh, what I mean by the Title VI ridership uh, showing increases during the pandemic is that we've seen that the, the percentage of total ridership as a whole uh, has increased. So uh, what that indicates to us and what I'm sure I'm almost certain uh, indicates to other transit agencies uh, throughout the nation is that our most transit dependent writers, our essential workers, our uh, communities of color and our, um, our low income communities have certainly been writing all throughout this time, regardless of what's happened with the pandemic and with even with the difficulties with shelter in place uh, mandates at the time. So um, it's not so much that the number increased, but proportionally we have seen that um, our communities of color and our low income communities are uh, make up the majority of our ridership on those routes. And so that's why it's become incredibly important for us to make sure that wherever we've had extra room to make those improvements, we make it on those routes that serve uh, the most of our Title VI communities. Thanks for that question. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and let's see. Um, I don't see any more raised hands at the moment. I thought I did. Let me just double check. Um, oh, yes, I do see raised hands from Sid. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Uh, Kotapati. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, hi, thanks. No worries about that name, by the way. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, real excited about all the uh, returns to full service. That'll definitely mean a lot to uh, all the writers, especially me. I'm very grateful for it. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about or suggest as an improvement, um, in the original 2019 uh, service plan, it was planned to have uh, the Route 523 running from Lockheed Martin all the way to the very Essen Bart station but now it's been cut back to San Jose. I was uh, wondering if maybe VTA could consider restoring it to running all the way back to Berryessa as it is right now. It's pretty difficult to go from the west side of San Jose or Cupertino all the way to uh, get to BART and uh, running the Route 523 all the way to Berryessa 
would really be a big improvement for that. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. I've, I've noted that down here and you are certainly not alone so far in requesting that it extends back. So I, we, will, we will see uh, how we can accommodate that as we get through more comments. Awesome, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. okay, and I will go back to our written questions. And I have a question here um, from Manuka, I believe that's how you say that. And it says, for the routes that serve the local hospitals, uh, Santa Clara Valley Medical, uh, I'm not really sure what GSH is. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Regional. I believe it's good. Good Sam Hospital. Good Sam. Okay. I was like, oh, not, not fast enough. Okay. And then regional. <laughs> uh, is it possible to consider the shift times so that employees can use it easier? Example being no service after 11 p.m. on a Sunday will limit any p.m. shift person from getting back home after their shift. Thank you for that comment. You know, I I think I believe this is something that uh, folks have chimed in about before, trying to meet our schedules with employee schedules and and their busiest uh, work shifts. And I I can't speak too much uh, as far as serving Good Sam Hospital and the Regional Medical Center. Um, perhaps Kermit might be able to chime in on some requests we've received in the past on coordinating our um, our, our schedules to meet uh, shifts. But for the SCVMC shuttle, because that, sh that shuttle is a service partnership that we have with the county, as well as with the, the Valley Medical Center campus, that one is absolutely geared towards uh, VMC employee shifts. That one not just matches up with uh, the busiest work shifts at the VMC campus, but it also matches up with the busiest uh, ACE, shuttle, or ACE, ACE train schedules, uh, Amtrak, Capital Corridor, uh, as well as Caltrain at Deridon Station. And because it is a partnership, we, we are very much prioritizing how those schedules match up. And, you know, on, on top of that, with the SC VMC shuttle, it is a first and last mile transit feeder shuttle. So it is really important that it connects uh, connects very tightly with work shifts and and train schedules since there's only a few trips in the morning as well as a few trips in the afternoon. So uh, so Kermit, I don't know if you would like to chime in on service uh, directly serving Good Sam Hospital, for instance, but because that is more of a a fixed route transit service that has um, you know, normal headways, then, you know, I, I think that's something that we would have to discuss, but Kermit, I'll, I'll let you chime in. Sure. Yeah, I guess the, the, the struggle with this kind of thing is in, in general, is that is the, the theory that if you run buses till 1am, people will use them and things. And the, the, the difficulty for like Janice and I is that we're given a certain amount of hours that we can run in, in a year and we have to figure out where it's going to be the most productive you know, I mean, Janice and I would like to see lots of lines running 24 hours and running every five minutes and full of people and everything. But, you know, the reality is we have a limited amount of service hours. And oftentimes, like, we'll get requests to run a bus at 11 p.m. and then we'll run it and, you know, one or two people ride it. And so it's it makes it kind of difficult for us to, we have to kind of prioritize what's actually going to get the most riders with the with the hours that we have. So it's a very valid request. It's just a matter of, you know, whether we can do every do everything, you know. Yes, yes, 100%. Uh, I I see I I I really appreciate these comments that are coming in about um, you know, accommodating more service workers and more of our essential workers, uh, especially in the late out, night hours. So it, they are certainly valid requests, but as Kermit's mentioned, it, it is a, a balancing act and we we want to weigh them accordingly. So, so th thank you again for that comment.
Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question. I don't see any hands, hands raised, so I'll go ahead and um, stay in our Q&A box here. And our next question is from Callie Wang. And it says, since routes are being moved from the Valley Fair Transit Center, the Winchester Stevens Creek intersection, intersection is becoming a transfer hub. This is a huge intersection with lots of fast traffic and little shade. What steps is VTA taking to make the transfer smoother and more accessible to, do to those with mobility, mobility limitations? There are new shelters, uh, detailed signage to help people find their bus. Um, what are the um, changes? I, I can start if you want, Janice. Uh, sure, okay. the, uh, it's, this is really something that there's some other people in VTA that know a lot more about this than I do. And so I'm just kind of taking a stab at it. I know the city is working on um, making some street improvements near the Valley Fair Santana Row area and that our bus stops are gonna be changing a bit. And um, we're, we, we we're trying to move the 523 stop to the Valley Fair area, but in order to do that, they need to make some improvements. So I know there's, there's several things in the works there along with shelters. I just, since I don't really work on that, I'm not as familiar with the, the, the details. Yeah, Kermit, thanks for adding in uh, some comments about the city's involvement in on this, because I, I think this comment is is great. Uh, we we certainly want to take note of that as we coordinate with the city on what these improvements are, because while some of that is under the city's control, the things that, that Kelly is uh, certainly bringing up are under VTA's control. So we certainly could tighten up the transfers since that is our intent for, for the 59 and the 60 to tie in uh, more seamlessly with the 23 and 523 service. But, um, you know, things like wayfinding uh, so that transfers are easily found and new shelters, anything to, to make the, the rider experience more comfortable as you're waiting in between transfers is is a, a great detail and, and comment to provide. So we will take note of that as we coordinate with the city on their improvements as well. Thank you. I, I know we've received a few, um, well, quite a few actually questions and answers that we were answering on the fly and didn't come out kind of publicly. You know, I, there was, um, some of them were not really questions, just just requests like to run the 51 on the weekend, for, for example, we got that. Another one was to, um, right, right now Route 60 runs live, very late night service, but only between Santa Clara and the, the Metro station and not the full route. And someone asked, just like in the previous meeting, someone asked, can you run that frequency for the whole, you know, that service span for the whole route. So we've been putting those down as suggestions as, as the meeting goes along, even though they weren't read out loud. So th those are two that uh, came up as, as requests that I've, I jotted down and we'll be looking into. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. I was just trying to, um, go through a few of them. I'm going to ask, there's um, several, and then I'll just provide the answer. Um, there's a question that says, what about the discontinued Route 10 to the San Jose Airport from the Santa Clara train station? Um, and that was answered. Um, the discontinued Route 10 is currently covered by Route 60 from the airport to the train station in uh, Santa Clara. Okay. And again, staff, if you'd like to add anything as I'm going through the questions, uh, please feel free to, um, or I'll, I'll just um, go through them. Okay. Uh, next question says, does Route 60 run both ways to and from San Jose Airport and back to Santa Clara train station? 
and what time frequencies does it, does it run and how late? And I was answered that yes, Route 60 currently runs both ways to the airport and to the train station. Today, Route 60 runs from 5 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. on weekdays and 5.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. on the weekends. In the 2023 plan, we are proposing to expand hours to 5 a.m. from 5 a.m. to 12 a.m. on all days. Um, and it will be every 15 minutes. Um, the frequency will be every 15 minutes on weekdays and every 20 minutes on the weekend. Okay. okay. Uh, the next question asks, um, route, route 39, which covers most of Evergreen, San Jose continues, Evergreen and San Jose continues to be a very infrequent service. Is there a possibility to make it every 30 minutes during commute hours on weekdays? Uh, and um, we will, we, we, we have taken note of that and we'll uh, add that as a request um, in our plan. Okay, um, another question says lots of cities have their own local transit services. C Cupertino has its own demand shuttle and um, I heard that Milpitas and Morgan Hill are starting their own shuttles as well. Will they be planned? Will they be planned to have fare slash schedule integration with VTA fixed route buses? And are they being proposed to replace fixed routes? Okay, and then the answer from staff, this on-demand shuttle service will not be replacing fixed route, ser fixed route service in the areas they serve. On-demand shuttles are not proposed to have fare slash schedule integration and will be run as pilots through their respective cities. I, I'd like to add to that response as well. So um, as Joseph's mentioned, thank you, Joseph. Uh, these are pilot programs. Uh, the, the Milpitas and Morgan Hill on-demand shuttle services are slated to begin as pilots uh, very shortly here. We've been hearing more uh, as we've been coordinating with them that they'll be starting uh, as early as August, probably leaning into to early September. And while they are starting off as pilot services and we don't at this time have a uh, fair or schedule integration with these on-demand services, that's not to say that it wouldn't happen in the future. I, I think they're because these are pilot service programs that are funded through VTA's Measure B 2016 program, this will give us an opportunity to monitor how those services go uh, in the next couple of years. And it may even pave the way for, for VTA to look into other citywide sort of on-demand services. And the reason that fares and schedules aren't integrated with VTA fixed route service at this time is because they're working with more of a um, more of a turnkey solution sort of company that not just provides the drivers and the shuttles that run the on-demand service, but they also uh, they are also integrated with an app where folks can uh, pay for fare by. Uh, uh, through the app, as well as uh, request these trips on the fly. So that's the reason why there isn't any um, any integration there with our schedules. But we're we're just as excited as anyone to to see these on demand shuttles run. We can't wait to see how they do. And you also may have noticed that they are on our our system maps. So we also want to make sure that folks are aware that these, these services will exist. All right, back to you, Moni. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Janice. Okay, and there's another question that says, um, is there an opportunity to expand service on the 51 
and operate daily instead of, week, instead of weekdays only, as it has been for many years, with a short stint of Saturday service when it was known as the 81. That line truly deserves daily service, but I do not fully understand where the issues lie, aside from the obvious issues like funding, operator availability, and other known issues. And that was answered by staff that um, we will put that down as a request. Um, and that, and it was noted that in the past, ridership was far below the minimum ridership standards on the weekend. Okay. 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 And then um, there's another question. It said, um, will you have a printout of the entire routes like you used to have? Uh, staff answered with, um, yes, time guides are available and will still be available in the future. Okay. And then we did have a request for uh, reposting the poll. And so I will do that. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that in just a few minutes um, as we're wrapping up the Q&A session so that anyone who didn't uh, get a chance or have time to answer the poll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and um, uh, try to launch that again for you. Okay. And there's a question. Um, it says, I've noticed that comparing maps of routes for 72, 73, 64, the old downtown and the old downtown routes that are, are used for 2019. Does this imply that the old routes will be returned or is this an oversight or am I misreading? And uh, that was answered by staff and it said that that sounds like an oversight um, and there will be no changes to the current routings in downtown. Okay, and then there was a question, um, so are any plans for a route to the Coleman Avenue Shopping Center um, from transit accessible from, from transit accessible from downtown? Uh, and so staff answered that at the, there is it at this time, but we will go ahead and add that as a suggested impro improvement. And there's a question, uh, if you are not considering new routes this year, when can we reasonably expect new routes or previously eliminated routes um, to be considered? Uh, and that was answered by staff um, that they will be considered for the 2024 transit service plan. Okay. And let's see. And what is the status of mandatory masks on transit? Oh, uh, what? And what will it be based on? Okay. Um, and so our staff has answered. Currently, masks are strongly recommended when riding BTA, and this is based off guidance and policies provided by local, county, states, federal um, officials our board members and BTA staff. Okay. Okay, and I'm going through and I think, yes, that we have reached the last of our questions. I'm gonna double check again to um, see if any of our participants have any, any other questions. Okay. We have some in the Q&A now, yeah. Is there another one in the Q&A? Okay, let's go try open up. Okay. Okay, and we have a question. Um, whatever frequencies and time spans may be for next year, better or worse, the perennial dilemma is whether time transfers can be coordinated between routes. Not just missed transfers with BART, and Caltrain at their hubs, uh, which seems to make no sense, but even lack of a short transfers um, that are missed by just a few minutes uh, within VTA. Um, so bus to bus at hubs, light rail to light rail at transfer stations, uh, bus to light rail or light rail to bus 
um, stations. This question follows the poll of 44% preferring better transfers. And this is Kermit. I, I will say that the, the real key to transfers is better frequency. That's, that's the, the bottom line answer, I guess. The, the better the frequency, the, the better the transfers are going to be. Because on, on almost all routes, most of the long routes have, have like 20 or 20 to 30 transfers along the way. And we as schedulers, we can only pick a couple to, to really gear the schedule off of, whether it be light rail or a BART connection or, or Caltrain. Uh, we look at all of them. But in, in the end, you you have to make some compromises. And the, the best way is if the buses are running, you know, 15 minutes or better, then even if you miss something by five minutes, it, it's a 10 minute wait, which is, a, you know, the, the other challenge, I guess, is when buses are running every 30 minutes, if you have one bus come, if you have, say, like the 26 comes five minutes before the 64, for those people, that's great. But for the people on the 64 that wanted that 26, that's a 25 minute wait. So it all depends on who's transferring where as to what, you know, what you can schedule it one way and it's great for someone and really bad for somebody else. So the real key is, is the better frequency in order to address that. Thank you, Kermit. Okay. Okay, and the next question that I have, it's to follow up on Winchester and Stevens Creek becoming a transfer point. Would it be possible to move the stops closer to the intersection, but make all stops located on the far side, on the far side, rather than a mix of near side and far side to make transfers more e efficient? Or will that involve a lot of talks with your engineering department to make the stop locations more amenable, amenable to transfers between the 23, 523, 59, and 60? Sorry, I was looking for my unmute button. Okay. I I could I could start the, the answer here. So um, it certainly would take uh, coordination with our engineering department, but it would certainly also include coordination with our cities who we oftentimes have to uh, apply for city permits for whenever we do make relocations, whether or not they were um, active routes at some point. But uh, that is certainly something that we should keep tabs on. We do have a better bus stops program that does like a zoom out big picture perspective of where we could improve our bus stop amenities. But um, in addition to the amenities, we do want to make sure that um, the, the locations of these stops are conducive to making these transfers. So we, we will certainly note this down and um, you know, have, have further conversations with the cities involved and the, uh, our engineering department, as well as um, our passenger facilities team. Thank you, Janice. Okay. And then I have a last question in our Q&A box. Okay. And it says service, service expansion request. I would love for a bus that goes up and down Lawrence Expressway, ideally coordinated to meet Caltrain schedule at their Lawrence station. Thank you. We'll, we'll put that down as a, a request. Yeah, we, we've yeah. Uh, operated some service on Lawrence in the, in the past and it's, it's difficult because you can't stop at Stevens Creek, for example, which is like a major connection, but there's no physical way to stop there. You can't even get off and get back on, you know, and uh, serving the Lawrence train station is very difficult as well to getting getting out and circling around. You, it's a, you have to do a big figure eight to go continue in one direction. So it, it is a, Lawrence is definitely a challenge. 
Good point. Uh, L- Lawrence in particular, but um, just expressways in general. I know we we certainly used to run our limited train service up and down expressways, but those have been uh, equally difficult to serve simply because they they also don't have stops that are very transit supportive or stop locations that are transit supportive or even safe for our pedestrians at time. But I I do want to note that for, for a future annual plan. And I think as Kermit mentioned, perhaps for the 2024 plan, we can we can certainly look into service expansions again. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so I am, it looks like we are, I don't, we are, um, all of our questions in our Q&A have been answered and uh, we don't have any more raised hands. What I'm trying to do now is to see if I'm able to relaunch the the poll that we had without getting rid of my um, results from the last one. If I cannot, um, I will reach out um, if any, and, and I will put in the, I will put it in the chat um, uh, and then you can answer it either there or I'll put in um, our email address so that you can send your answer that way. So I'm gonna try, but if I if it's gonna cause me to lose my other information from the last poll, I won't be able to relaunch it. And that is what it's saying to me. So if anybody else, unless anybody else on the panel knows, I do not want to um, get rid of my other report information. So what I'll go ahead and do is check the chat and I'll put the information in the chat uh, and then you can answer from that. Um, first, you can answer that way. Moni, I did want to read one more uh, uh, comment, rather, just for the sake of sharing with the group a question that came in or a clarification. And um, it reads, just to clarify, and I don't think you read this yet, but okay. it says, just to clarify, Cupertino self-funded the VIA on-demand shuttle system. No Measure B grants were used. And I just wanted to confirm that that is correct. And I appreciate that clarification. Um, I, I did want to reiterate that the only ones that were funded by Measure B 2016 were the Morgan Hill and Milpitas on-demand services that are slated to begin later this summer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, and I am, we do have one more um, poll for you. And this is just our satisfaction question. Okay, and I will go ahead and launch that now and I will give everyone a few minutes to um, respond.
Okay, perfect. Thank you all for um, your responses on that question. And that will um, uh, go to staff. Thank you again. Okay. Okay, and that ends our, um, let's go ahead and send that. Okay, and again, in the chat, um, I put in uh, the question, um, okay, okay. Um, I did put in the poll question that some people missed. So um, go ahead and check the chat and then um, email the re your response, feel free to email your response to uh, our customer service and it's customer.service at bta.org or you can leave it in the chat as well. Um, if you would like to do that. Um, thank you. Okay. And it does look like um, there's another question. So let me let, let me go back to the Q&A box and, um, and answer that. And there's also another hand raised. So let me go to the Q&A box first, and then I will address um, our participant that has raised her hand. Okay. And the question is, are Oak Ridge and Almaden forever dead stations? Uh, and then could the blue line ever go there and the green line be realigned between Santa Teresa and Winchester um, like the old Sharks train? Uh, if this ever happened, it would demand, it would demand timed transfers at Discovery Museum. Yeah, I don't have you know really the answer for the whether they're dead stations forever. That's sort of something to be d decided later on. But the the one, you know, they were not able to find a good way to integrate it into the into the system. The the blue line coming from Santa Teresa, most of the ridership is going downtown and places further north. So if if a line were to be going from Santa Teresa and loop back to Winchester you would still need another line coming up, going straight from, from the San Teresa area, going, going straight up. So, um, but uh, yeah, it, that's to be determined at a, at a later time when they do light rail studies, but I'm not aware of any uh, plans to reopen those stations as, as light rail stations. Okay. Thank you for that, Kermit. Okay, and then we're gonna go to um, Tricia. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute and if you will unmute so that you can speak. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just have a really quick, um, um, something to, to, um, to say about putting, putting a, the um, survey in the chat. Um, chat doesn't work. Just so you know. Just so you know. I don't know if you know, but chat doesn't work well with people who are are using screen readers. Um, so that's um, so for them doing it that way um, isn't fully accessible. So maybe they could. Um, they can do it through email or something. Um, anyway, just let, just let, just FYI. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for letting me know that because that was something that um, staff did not know. So thank you for letting letting us know that. Uh, did were oh, you sure. able, were you able to fill out the um, the poll when it um, popped up on your screen? Yes, I don't. Yeah. I don't okay. I don't use a screen reader, but you know, okay, but but say, just for those who do. Work. Yeah, just to know okay. people who okay. do and a lot of people do. So okay. okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that feedback and thank you for letting us know. Okay. Okay. And then I did have a couple more questions in the QA. Um and it says is BTA staff conducting direct outreach on the service plan on the buses and trains? 
So we we won't be able to hit every single route on you know every bus and every train, but something we are going to be doing in the next couple of weeks is perching out on some of our transit centers and the downtown customer downtown San Jose customer service center and you know that's a great point because again we really want to make sure that we're reaching our riders at times that are helpful for them to uh, weigh in on the 2023 service plan and hopefully we won't be catching them on at such a busy time where they've got to rush over to go on their way to work or anything like that but uh, we we really dearly miss the face-to-face -face interaction and something new that we do want to try are the more of these transit pop-ups um, and I was fortunate to be able to catch some of you at Viva Calle this past weekend, which was great. Um, and we also got feedback that way. And uh, lastly, I hope that for, for those of you who have been writing our service in the past week, uh, that you've been hearing the, the audible messages on our bus and light rail trains announcing this outreach period for the 2023 service plan since I, I do know that's other that's an additional way to make sure that the word gets out there and that we're collecting as much feedback from you as possible. All right. Thank you. The next question, um, it's when VTA counts ridership, is it strictly fares per hour or is there any ability to consider how many person miles are being provided? Sure, I can take that question from Betsy. So we uh, collect VTA ridership on our system in several ways. Our most prominent way of collecting our ridership is on our APCs, our automatic passenger counters. And these are installed on nearly every single one of our bus and our light rail trains. I know for sure um, that, you know, on the bus, there's just a very small percent of our fleet that does not have these APCs. So that those are being counted manually. But as far as ridership goes, we're able to determine how many times or how many riders board our service um, as well as get off. At, and it, it's very detailed to the extent where we're able to track where our busiest stops are, what our busiest routes are, what time of day um, our routes are the busiest as far as picking up and dropping off our passengers. So um, other than, you know, other than what you've mentioned, fares per hour, that uh, the fare box, uh, the fare boxes and the number of times people pay on our system is not our primary way of looking at ridership. It really is uh, being pulled from those automatic passenger accounts that I've mentioned. And as, as far as considering how many person miles are being provided, that's not the level of detail that we are able to collect, but you know, through different uh, modeling exercises and basing how many of our riders do board our bus and light rail systems, we are able to at least make some some high level assumptions on how many on, on you know based on how much ridership is happening and how far our our um, our riders are riding. So um, that's not like a, a clear cut answer that we have that's tracked, but it is something that we're able to project and and plan accordingly with as we. Uh, look to improve our service. So I hope that helps. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next question um, is from Avery and it um, says, I was curious about plans to speed up light rail through downtown. Are there plans to give signal priority or increase the speed <coughs> limit in the next few years? That's always a big hot topic question. So uh, we do have a transit planning team that is focused primarily on uh, those issues that you're talking about. How do we speed up transit? And you know, signal priority, speed limits, working with our cities on how we prioritize transit in their respective cities is a very concentrated program that we call our fast transit program. 
And um, I do know that that team is very, very much working hard with our cities to to make that happen uh, along our most uh, transit supportive corridors like Stevens Creek, uh, First Street even um, for for light rail, um, El Camino Real. Uh, I don't have that detail to share with you at this time, but um, I can certainly, I think what would, what may help is uh, sharing the fast transit program webpage that may have more information about uh, where we stand today with all of that. So uh, Modi, what do you think? Should I just pop that into the chat? And um, maybe we could offer up a a follow-up if you wanted to learn more information about the fast transit program. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I accidentally muted myself while I was talking. Um, Sure, yeah, let's pop that into the chat so we can have that. Um, let's see, okay. And then um, um, last question that I have here, um, uh, but again, I'm not rushing. We have, we still have some more time um, so that, so if you have more questions or you think of something, feel free. Um, the question is from David and it's, how are you upgrading the buses themselves? Electric, green, or size of the buses, et cetera. Kermit, would you like to to start that off? I can start that off, sure. I know that the the goal is to transition to an electric bus fleet, uh, but it's very it's very challenging, you know, right right now. And we have some electric buses now, but they're more like a pilot thing. the The challenge has been the the battery range on them is that most of them can go up to like 150 miles or so, but most of our all day buses are out for well over that, more than 200 miles and things. And so there's certainly, it sounds like in the future, there will be batteries that will accommodate larger ranges because what, as it is now to use an electric bus, we'd have to bring a bus out for like, let's say, leave it at, start at 5.30 in the morning and bring it back in at noon and bring another bus back out at noon to to finish off like that, which is very very costly and inefficient, especially with the drivers and everything. So, um, but there are plans to, they've been, you know, to go to an electric fleet. They've also been looking at maybe hydrogen as a, but they all have their pros and cons. Some of them have, you know, very high costs in terms of um, building things at the yards where you have to have fueling stations and and things. They've looked, they're looking at in charging, um, in route charging stations, like at popular places, say like a Palo Alto and Eastridge where a bus could come in to get a 10 minute charge and then go back out to keep to be able to run longer. So that's all being being looked at, but it's still kind of in the infant stage, I think. It looks like we have a follow up, Kermit. Um, it says, what about hybrid? We looking into that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all being explored. It, it's not something that Janice and I really work work on. It's sort of a different uh, planning effort that that's working with the, the uh, engineering on on that to try to find like the best best overall solution for the for the buses. But the, the goal is to sort of eliminate diesel by a certain point and go to a you know more sustainable thing. They just there's there's quite a bit of um, Work to be done to, in the technology and things to to be to be make that a reality. But it's not just us; it's the other transit agencies are in the same boat. Yeah. You know? So there is progress being made. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. And we have another question from David, and it's um, what what can we expect in fair hikes? Hi, David. So I can chime in here. Uh, well, I actually, I'm going to chime in here to say that I can't chime in because we, I, as far as I know, we are not anticipating any uh, upcoming fare increases for our service, but that certainly isn't within the purview of our service planning team and getting into the 2023 service plan. Uh, but I do know that whenever we do consider fare increases, it does have to go through an extensive community outreach process, much like what we're doing here today. So uh, you will certainly know about any 
changes in fares uh, like well before they would be implemented. But unfortunately, that's that's not an answer that I I have today. Okay, thank you, Janice. Okay. Um, okay, so I don't see any more questions. Uh, let me just double check and see if anyone has a, their hands raised. And um, I don't see any more hands. Um, okay, so I will go ahead and um, end our Q&A session. Um, and, and just thank everybody um, that is here for uh, participating with us. And thank you all for the feedback um, that you've given the staff um, for those requests that you that you provided for staff to um, go and take a look at. Um, we will do that. Um, and then just for your questions. And thank you, I thank you again for being succinct. Um, and allowing time for staff to answer and then also allowing time for um, your fellow participants to ask their questions and make their comments. I do appreciate that. And I appreciate um, everyone being um, courteous to um, each other. We need more of that. Uh, and I will go ahead and I will give it over to Janice. Sounds good. Thank you, Moni. Again, thanks everyone for spending a couple of hours with us this afternoon now. I hope you have a wonderful lunch uh, planned ahead. And, you know, as we wrap up here, uh, please, please remember our outreach period is not over yet. We've got until July 8 to uh, take on any more comments you've got, any questions you've got for us for the 2023 service plan. And I, I hope we, we can continue to, to hear more from you. And if you know of anyone else who would like uh, this level of detail information about the plan, we do have one more meeting planned. Uh, again, that is on June 28th from 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, as always, feel free to point them to our customer service team as well as uh, Menominee, who's also shared 